Today's episode will be with Mark Fitzpatrick. Um, I've known Mark for a couple of years. Um, we've sort of communicated on Zoom and stuff like that. Um, and there's some very powerful uh, things about stories and uh, how you can use those to really inform your life. So this one's going to be in two sections, um, pretty much back to back, uh, but it's just a little bit easier with the editing. So let's get on with the show. <laughs> Today's episode, I'm going to be talking to Mark Fitzpatrick. Mark, good to see you. Hey, Vic, good to see you. So, um, look, traditional first question: What do you do? As little as I can. Um, I, I've been, I've been trying to figure it out. You know, ever, ever since I was very young, I've been trying to figure out what I would be when I grow up, and I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to be when I grow up. Um, and I've started to face the fact that the when I grow up thing may never happen um, and that I better just start being something now or doing something rather. Um, and I think I'm a writer. I think that's what I do, even if I'm not doing it. I think I'm a writer. Yes. I'm a teacher as well. Um, so I teach, I write and I uh, read a lot of books. Cool. And you do you do. Uh do read a lot of books I, 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 do, I do I can vouch for that um although I mean it's it's one of the strange things and I think I'm not the only one um to experience this is that the last couple of years have been absolutely horrendous for our attention spans and I know a lot of people who like myself would have basically defined themselves as I'm a reader and that's what I do. And wherever I am or whatever I'm doing, I am also reading a book. Um, and, you know, I'm not alone in struggling to keep my attention on a book, to, to finish reading a whole book um, these days. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I, I lose track halfway through uh, a short article or, you know, if it's not a meme, it's too long. But um, I'm slowly getting back there. I'm, I'm sort of I'm doing a big effort to get back to um, paper books and uh, writing by hand and, you know, stuff that slows you down and you can't click on anything and that you don't have to react to it or, you know, make comment on it or yeah. you just sit there with it. Yes. So this, that's already, you've, you've put a lot of interesting things out there. Um, apart from the attention span thing and, and maybe, go, you know, maybe the solution to that is, getting back to old style, you know, physical mm. stuff. Cool. Yeah. So let's take you back because obviously you're, you're not in the same country as me at the moment. That's right. Um, in France at the moment. You're in France, but you don't sound like a Frenchman. So let's, let's see if we can plot the course. Would you, where well, did you grow up? Yeah, go on. Where did you grow up? The easy answer is Cork in Ireland. Um, but actually, it's a bit of a patchwork because I, I was born in Australia. Um, and my parents are both Irish, but they're both sort of second, third generation emigrants. Um, although one emigrated to, you know, Irish Catholic Liverpool and the other is from Belfast which isn't really an emigrant um, but they both had UK passports let's say um, and when just after I was born they moved to Cork um, which for both of them was sort of you know had the impression they were coming home to Ireland and uh, you know Cork being what it was at the time um, that wasn't the impression other people had they thought they were blow-ins they thought they were foreigners um so i grew up being very aware that i was irish but um it was not quite the same as all the other irish people around me and uh and then we also moved around so um my dad is an academic and uh 
he would take sabbaticals when he could. And so I did have a very formative year of my childhood living in the south of France. And then another formative year of my teenage years going to high school in Massachusetts. And then when I was in college, I also did uh, you know, a year abroad in Berkeley in California. And I did, I studied in Paris as well. And then I moved to Paris when I was, I, mean, I was only 23. So I've, I've kind of lived there almost half my life now. Um, and I just left Paris um, a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, it's been a bit all over the place. And we had family um, kind of all over the world, you know, my dad's family, um, Belfast in the 70s, and he's one of six siblings who all lived in six different countries uh, for all of my childhood. And then a lot of my mom's family lived in, in Britain. Um, so, you know, I think that it's easy now to answer where are you from? Because I live in France and I just say I'm Irish. But sometimes if I'm in Ireland and somebody says to me, especially if I'm in Cork, um, somebody says to me, where are you from? And I'll say, um, I'm, I'm from here, I'm from Cork. And they'll go, ah, no, but you're not real Cork. Like, you know, they'll pick up my accent and they'll pick up whatever. And they'll just kind of look askance at me when I tell them that I'm from the same place they are. Yes. That's interesting. There's a lot of things there, which is, um, I'm just going to sort of suggest something that, that might be very much the Irish experience of that, the traveling side of it, mm. you know, parts of the family being elsewhere. And, uh, yeah, it seems absolutely. to go. And I think it seems to go with the territory somehow. It, yeah, and I mean, I think that there's a sort of, um, you know, there's an Irishness that um, is is common to a diaspora of something like 80 million people, whereas Ireland itself only has 5 million. So um, I think Irishness is really important to people, um, some of whom have never set foot in Ireland. Um, and it's really important also to people who, who have had to leave. You know, um, there's, I think there's the Irish experience of uh, missing home is, um, is a really big deal. Um, and the Irish experience of coming home, um, you know, there's uh, all the, um, the airports at Christmas are festooned with um, uh, welcome home. You know, it's not it's not people coming as tourists. It's not people, um, it's not people coming uh, to visit. It's it's people who are on a brief trip home. And you know, these days, of course, we can do that. But there's also a lot of people who would leave and they would not come home, would not be able to, um, for many many years. And stories about you know the the rich American cousin who made it big, and he would come back and be all swank and buying rounds in the bar. I mean, it's it's a huge, rich sort of experience, um, the diasporic experience. And I think it 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 is a very um, kind of melancholy, bittersweet, nostalgic thing, all of which the Irish are great at. Yes, I would say so. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, there's a... I think people who don't live in Ireland, who who have got ancestors that are Irish. Yeah. I've sort of seen this and it's almost, I would use the word like a, a, a desperation to be Irish. I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that, mm. that there's a real calling to be Irish. Um, and even to the point that, because there is something like that in, in my family, mm. where um, there was this sort of thing that part of the family were Irish, but I've done a lot of research into the ancestry, and not that I can find. <laughs> so I don't know whether there were some that, that sort of moved out there that were cousins that I don't know, but they, we cert they didn't seem to be coming in from Ireland. And strangely, oh. it actually disappointed me <laughs> to find that I didn't have any connections because that was always said. 
So I'm just wondering, I understand. You know, I understand. There's a magic I to think it. It's, there is, a it's, a very special, it's a very special identity, and it's one yes. that um, people, um, I mean, one of the benefits of being Irish, one of the huge benefits, is that you go anywhere in the world and nobody goes, oh, God, I hate them. You yes. know? Everybody <laughs> goes, every, everybody goes, way Ireland, you know. Yeah. And, I mean, it helps to be, yes. it helps to have never, you know, um, colonized anyone <laughs> since Scotland. And that was, you know, 1300 years ago. Yeah. Um, but um, like, you know, we're, we're, we're uniquely privileged because we are um, a, a white English speaking European nation and we are not associated with imperialism or colonialism, quite the opposite. We're seen as being on the side of the oppressed and the underdog, et cetera. Yeah. And it's incredible. I mean, you can, you can go anywhere and um, people will welcome you as one of their own. They'll be like, oh, you're, you're our people, you're Irish, especially, um, you know, and it, it might sound a bit weird to say it, and it is its own weird kind of white privilege, but minorities will often when they learn you're Irish, they'll be like, oh, well, you're not really white then. You know, you're, you're more like us. And um, the, joke, the joke goes that when, they, um, when a plane gets hijacked, they shoot the Irish last because we're assumed to have terrorist sympathies. And, you know, but, it's, but then, you know, in, in, in a more sort of wholesome way, um, people just associate the Irish with being good fun, um, romantic, getting drunk, um, you know, nobody nobody thinks that we're um, we're assholes, you know, which is lovely, and quite the opposite. People people romanticize the Irish. Yeah. Um, everybody does it. Everybody does it a bit, but especially people with their own Irish heritage, because I think that there's something about being Irish that um, it appeals to people who feel um, like they're just you know um, normal and boring. And then you think, ooh, there's a little whiff of the Celtic mist about it, you know, sort of something a bit mysterious, something a little bit mystical. Um, so I think that we, we are sort of the we are sort of the go to um, bit of atmosphere in your family tree, you know. That's right. I, I, t I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. Um, OK, so you said that So we, you obviously travel around a lot um, and obviously from what you've already said, your parents were already traveling around a lot anyway. So yeah, that, yeah. That was part of that. Um, and, you, and your father was an academic. Yes. Um, Mathematician. And we, oh, okay. So not, not the same sort of territory as yourself. Not at all. Not at no. all. This is my, if you will, this is my, um, my, my most extreme rebellion. I was like, okay, dad, well, I'm going to be a university lecturer too but not in maths in english you know so literature is my big rebellion but, right uh, so when did you, when, you i'm assuming you always read because you said that you were a writer so as soon as somebody says that i always it always point? and um yeah it was you know i was one of those kids who who sort of um could speak at a not just a kind of a remarkably early age but it was like eerily early um you know about a year old and um 13 months, 14 months, if you believe my parents. And I tend to. No, I, I, I can believe that. Uh, you know, and they, and, but, but it wasn't like just, you know, um, saying words. It was like quoting poetry, um, you know, which apparently um, once really um, frightened a hitchhiker who, <laughs> who my parents picked up and there was this little baby in a car seat, you know, and then we're, um, <laughs> we're, we're, crossing the, we're crossing the river in Cork and I came out with... Uh, that's my own lovely Lee, which is a song on the banks of my own lovely Lee, you know, and yeah. um, and this poor, you know, sort of German hitchhiker jumped out of their skin, I think. But yeah, yeah it was, it was, so you know, I was I was I was really um, precocious in reading, precocious in writing, precocious in speaking, um, and you know, I've always had a hard time shutting up. Um, I revel in speaking, and I revel in. Uh, reading, writing, you know, expression, but not just expressing myself, but also in conversation. Like I love listening to other people too and um, chatting to people. And given the choice, I would always rather talk to people than work. No, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So, okay. So 
you've already we've already got the fact that your school was probably okay, was it? It wasn't too tra- traumatic. It, it wasn't traumatic, but I think that um, I'm I'm part of a funny generation because um, you know I grew up so I I, I grew up um, in the eighties um, in in Ireland, and what a lot of people don't understand is that my childhood had a lot more in a way in common with a childhood from the 1950s or something Mm. than a childhood from the 90s or 2000s because when I was a little kid you know our headmaster was a monk wearing black clothes um there was corporal punishment there was um you know we had we had two tv channels which didn't even broadcast at night it was a test pattern on the screen um we had, you know, as a kid in Ireland, in, in Cork, um, you couldn't buy, um, you couldn't buy dry pasta. The only spaghetti we had was Heinz in a tin. Um, you couldn't get espresso. You couldn't, you know, the only coffee was that kind of dusty Maxwell House stuff, you know, not even granules. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, and I can really, re- when I read something from um, earlier in the 20th century, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I get that. Yeah. But then... Uh, you know, people who are only 10 years younger than me or 15 years younger than me, um, by the time they were growing up, the internet was there and, you know, cable television and all of that. So my early childhood was very, very sort of um, old fashioned. Mm -hmm. And so people who are my age now in their 40s, um, you know, we really saw a sort of head spinning rate of change in our lifetime. That's interesting I'm because like, yeah. there, there's something about that experience which is a bit like countries that, you know, like India or certain places in, in, in Africa that went from like no telephones to mobile phones, literally like that. And it, they yeah. let sort of, there was a leapfrogging in technology. Yeah. Um, and that was sort of, that's a similar sort of experience to what you said. There was no sort of graduation of like, mm. you know, you had this uh, and then this came in and, and then there was that. It's almost like you had that, as you, as you said, you know, it was like you, it was more like the 1950s. Yeah, and then it, it, it's true. It's true. And, and there's this transformation. The, um, the, 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 the Irish experience was so interesting as well, because we're so close to Britain and we could always see what was going on in Britain and, mm. Or, or just leave and go there, you know? Um, mm. And I think that Ireland, not just um, in terms of technology and, and sort of what's available and so on like that, but even, even as a society has leapfrogged certain elements. Um, I mean, when you look at the sort of, um, we have gone from a country, you know, 30, 40 years ago where divorce was illegal, abortion was illegal. Um, we've gone from that to being, the first country in the world to um, sign gay marriage into law by popular referendum, um, by a landslide. And then, you know, they finally got it together to, to re-hold the, the abortion debate. And again, it passed by a landslide. And I think that um, this is to do with so many things, but I mean, I think we can't not mention the kind of the downfall of the grip that the Catholic Church has. Yes, <laughs> I was going to say. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because because I mean I absolutely grew up in that, um, and by the nineties, the two thousands, um, as a function of just people sort of, I think becoming more sophisticated, but also the scandals that were coming out and the inquiries, and you know it's it's been an incredibly traumatic time. Also, it's been it's been growing pains for Ireland. Yes. I mean, we're a young country, you know, Ireland is is literally just celebrating its 100th anniversary as a an independent nation as an independent modern nation and paradoxically we also have um one of the longest views on our history of anyone in europe because you know irish monks were writing stuff down when the rest of europe was kind of descending into the dark ages and um the, the manuscripts and stuff like that were being destroyed the learning of the roman empire was being destroyed and Ireland conserved it with these little fellas on islands and mountains scribbling um, in, you know, dry stone constructions. It's, the, again, which is there's something so romantic and quixotic about that very idea 
that these Irish monks are sitting on the very, very far edge of Europe on little islands that are almost unreachable in order to be closer to God. And they're writing in this kind of pidgin Latin, sort of Gaelic, early Irish. Um, but they're writing stuff that is their own history, but also the history of the, the world as they knew it, the history of, and then they go out and start re-evangelizing the rest of Europe. Um, it's, it's really strange. And also this is another reason why Ireland kind of punches above its weight culturally because um, you know the 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 Irish have sent um, missionaries all over the world, but they've not been the ones that came with fire and a sword. They've been the ones that came and took the side of oppressed peoples where they were. But we've also been sending um, you know uh, pubs and chambermaids and um, bakers and uh, you know just. Irish people have gone everywhere yes. and everyone's got an Irish grandmother in North America. Um, and I, 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 I tend to think in Britain too, like, you know, you, the myth of your Irish ancestry, there probably is someone Irish in there. Oh, could, it's just the, there is, you know, there is totally. I mean, I mean, a well, hundred well, years ago, 150 years ago, the, the, there's, there's not a lot of records from those times, you know, no. for, for some people, they might've just lost everything. So the other thing is that, you see, I grew, I grew up in Cornwall, and uh, just about everywhere in Cornwall is named after some Celtic saint who mm. nobody knows anything about, but probably came over from Ireland. Um, and there seems to be something very interesting about the learned Irish. It's, because it's not just... What do you think it is? I don't know. This is the thing, because, you know, it is there in the sort of Celtic Christianity. Yeah, they are, the, you yeah. know, the learned people. Um, whether that's maybe what what Great Britain was like before the Romans arrived, um, yeah. and, and maybe the, you know the vestiges of that type of, because obviously there were people travelling to places like Stonehenge and all the rest of it from all over Europe. We know that because of remains, for people. sure. Yeah. yeah. So there was obviously a, a great appeal to the islands themselves like they were on the edge of the world before you traveled you know that sort of mythical thing of traveling to the west in other words yeah, yeah, traveling exactly. to the isles that you never return from type of mm. thing exactly. um, so there is something in that thing about the irish the you know the way with words there is definitely something well, i mean I've, I've got I've, I've got a bit of a theory about it because i think that um you know, absolute thing, if you had to distill it down to one thing, it's the poetic nature. It's not, you know, yes. it's not the technical knowledge, it's not the erudition, it's the poetry. And I think that part of it is to do with the um, the learned people being an oral tradition, but not an oral tradition because they were illiterate, because they absolutely could write. And, you know, the Druids who were the learned class of the sort of Celtic Irish, um, they could absolutely write, but um they refused to i mean they could write in in greek script or latin yes. script or yes. whatever um they had ohm writing which they used just for signposting things basically you can't write a book in it but um they refused to and i think and i've thought about it a lot um i think it's because um if you write something down and we know this too well today you're allowed to forget it like if you write down someone's phone number, I mean, when I was a kid, I used to know 20, 30, 40 phone numbers off by heart. Now I can't even remember my wife's phone number or even sometimes my own. Um, and so as soon as something was committed to paper in a book, it was out of sight, out of mind. Um, and so it was to keep the knowledge alive in your head. And then, you know, it also meant that um, nobody else could steal it. They couldn't steal your book. And even if they were to torture you or whatever, they wouldn't make head or tail of it because the thing about oral knowledge is that it must be mnemonically encoded, which was done through poetry. So all of the knowledge was um, was learned in a kind of a, a rote form, but it was learned, you know, like um, like you'll see in epic poems, like in Homer, which was originally oral. It's got a, a, um, a set of poetic rules, like of of rhythm, of of the meter, the, the um, alliteration of rhyme of epithets 
and all of those things to aid memory and sometimes even like obscure symbolism you know almost encoded um and so i think that the the oral tradition still exists in a sense because there's a great store set on telling stories and anecdotes and um you know we've still got the figure of the shanachi which is the irish for storyteller but it means the one who knows the old knowledge yeah i think that's right I, and and the other thing also with writing things down is uh, how can you capture something that's a deep knowledge you, it's yeah. just not it's not possible. Yeah, you can't. You can. You, you can't, you can't that. pin that to the page. No. You know, you um, no. without the without the human voice, the spirit coming through it. You know, um, but absolutely, and I think that's something to do with it. Um, and then the other another thing that strikes me is that also, um, like like many sort of uh, colonized populations, um, we have uh, we we're used to speak bilingually like we used to having two languages um we learn irish from when we're kids i mean people not everyone speaks it perfectly but everyone can and so we all know what it is to switch languages but we're also taught a lot to code switch you know we're taught that um if you want to get ahead you have to speak english in a certain way which might not be your local accent and dialect i mean this is certainly true of britain too yeah. um if you want to so people, um, educated Irish people, all sound quite similar to each other, quite similar to me, in fact, um, because our accents are neutralized and they're sort of um, made understandable, made uh, palatable for other ears. And we keep just enough, you know, still to keep the sort of the, the charming accent. But um, I know that even for me living 20 years in France, my accent has become um, it sounds more British than it used to because I'm very aware that the students that I teach are supposed to be learning English with a British accent. So um, it's been known to happen that uh, some kid will be taught by an Australian or an Irish person, and then they'll be they'll get marks taken off them in their oral exam by a by a French person who's an, oh. an English teacher, but doesn't recognise that what they're saying is authentic um, English dialect and thinks their just pronunciation is wrong. Interesting. Very interesting. Right. So when did you realise that stories and words had the sort of power that they've got? Or, or didn't you realise and you for, it just sort of, it was always there? No, I, um, probably always there. Probably always there. I think it's, it's probably just been um, sort of the, the, the air I've, been breathing all my life but I think that there is a moment where you realize um the power it has over other people I mean I think obviously in my family um telling stories was a big thing reading books was a big thing um I I have you know all of my grandparents are uh particularly good storytellers um particularly my two grandfathers and um the and my grandmother uh, one of my grandmothers in particular um has the most incredible memory for family stories like she, she can tell you sort of absolutely incredible stories about the whole family um some of which may or may not be completely true but there's also this kind of element of mythologization you know <laughs> um and uh i think that when i was a kid um i started to learn when i was in primary school that you could captivate an audience with a story um because, you know, I would, I, I started uh, writing stories and uh, telling stories and I used to love making comic books. Um, and at one point I remember um, I had a kind of a scam going where myself and my editorial committee would put together a comic book and then I would get my dad to photocopy them in work so it didn't cost me anything. And then I'd sell them for 12p each. And um, so I made a killing. Um, and I also used to like, I used to realize that if you could catch people with a good story, you could divert them from other things. Um, so I remember I, I, when I was about nine or 10, um, I wrote a play uh, that we performed in school. I think we did it in our, our speech and drama class or something. 
And then every time a different teacher would come in, we would say, oh, we've got a play. And we would divert them from the lesson by putting on a play. Um, you know, so I think there was a, this idea that like, if you can keep someone listening long enough, you can put off whatever the horrible inevitable is, which it just strikes me as kind of a bit Arabian Nights. You know, yes. if you keep keep your audience um, entranced, yes. then they they won't think about whatever horrible thing you know they were actually there to do. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's that's a really which is point. usually which is usually just work, you know. Yes, but you know, that can be horrible. But that, no, but that's what I mean. Like you know, I think that um, telling stories perhaps um, has always been something that I've used to get out of work. So I mean, ideally, it becomes your work. Um, yeah. And then you feel like you're getting getting away with things all the time, you know. Yeah. I, to some extent, I would say that's exactly what I do when I teach a musical instrument. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because the problem, you could just literally get people just to play exercises and stuff. Mm. And that would just be so boring for people. And they wouldn't actually learn anything because it's none of that stuff's in context. You know, if you're learning solo, you you know, you don't know anything about, it's just a bunch of notes in a song. Yeah. As soon as you start to tell them about, you know, that style of music and, and the techniques, mm. maybe where they came from, and all the rest of it, 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 it makes that come to life. But that's actually by telling the story. So yeah, I, 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 I totally get that. Um, and also, you can. And I think that what's 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 kind of interesting is that um, you actually see this now uh, in in the corporate world, in teaching, and all of this stuff that they're starting to come around to this idea of storytelling as a tool and, you know, kind of one of the tools that you need um, in order to uh, sell an idea to someone or in order to explain an idea to someone. It works a lot better if there's a story. Yes. And, you know, this is what, this is something that I teach students. I mean, I've, I've taught all sorts of students uh, in France. I've taught um, law students and I've taught uh, engineering students and, you know, the engineering students, they are going to have to stand up in front of someone to make a presentation, uh, showing them about their new, their pitch for, for a startup or their, their pitch for a new piece of equipment. And it has to be a story. I mean, to be effective, I think it has to be a story. Um, and this is something, this is not just an Irish thing, but it's, it's an Anglophone thing. I would say particularly British and Irish that you notice in, <clears throat> in academic conferences all the time is that when the French people get up to make it, to deliver a paper, they will literally read um, an article that they've written and try and get as many words in as fast as they can with their head down in a monotone. Um, whereas uh, a British person or an Irish person who gets up on the stage, they immediately tell a story, they're communicating. Yeah. Um, and a lot of them, a lot of them barely refer to their notes uh, or they just kind of have a few slides and they speak off that. But they engage the audience because they're um, they're telling them a story. They're they're giving them something. They're giving them a narrative thread to hold on to. You know. Yeah, I think um, oratory is obviously a very important aspect of of this. You know, the lands that we we inhabit. Um, lots of very famous characters were great orators. Mm-hmm. Elizabeth I, for instance, um, obviously yeah. Churchill. But, you know, they're great orators. Um, and you think, well, that's some, there's something in that. Maybe the language actually lends itself to that. I don't know. So, one of these things are difficult to, you know, we're always sort of poking yeah. around in the dark with stuff. But mm. it, is hard, it is hard to know, but it's true that um, English is... Um, I mean, my, my, my comparison, uh, French, I know best, but I, I've learned a little bit of German, a little bit of Italian. Um, and English does have that thing where it's very, it is very dynamic and its stress patterns are very interesting um, compared to French. Like, for example, the way you scan poetry in English and French is totally different um, because French is just a number of syllables, whereas English has the stressed syllables and 
there, there's kind of a shift in the stress and all of that. Um, English does lend itself a lot to a dynamic delivery. Mm. Um, and it's and it's a very rich language because it's absorbed bits and pieces from so many others um, that we often have a really wide range of close synonyms, but with a little nuance of difference. Um, so, you know, we're able to, we've got a huge palette. Like English is, mm. English is a real sort of magpie of a language. Yeah. Um, it's, it's robbed from everywhere. And, I was going to say it's theft. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, around the bush. my favorite, <laughs> my favorite, um, I, there's a couple, there's actually a couple of them, but you know, these things, you see them going around a little bit, yeah. but um, my favorite thing about how English came about is um, English is what happens when uh, Norman knights try to chat up Saxon barmaids. Yes. <laughs> and, yes. And it's all, the other one is English is the kind of language that would follow another language down a dark alley and knock it on the head and go through its pocket for a vocabulary. Yeah. Yes. I think that's a, that's a that's quite a good description, basically. That sums it up. Um, so, France then. What was the tr- attraction of oh, Paris? I mean, come on, that's, that's says it all, really. Yeah, I guess, you know, Paris. It, it does say, say it all. But you know, I was I was really primed to love France because, um, uh, you know, there was a year I spent here in the south of France uh, when I was eight years old and it was a really um, and we were living in the countryside it was really brilliant it was like it was really picturesque you know it was sort of they had us in treading grapes for the wine harvest oh, kind of wow. thing um, yeah. you know the school the school kids um, so it was really like this kind of idyllic thing yeah. and uh, you know and so because I was the age I was I actually picked up the language really well yeah. and I kept it up and I sort you know I sort of kept a relationship with French and with the language and culture but even going back like my mum um her family used to go camping in Brittany in the 60s um when that was still relatively unusual you know um for for an English, uh, an English family and uh uh my grandmother um maintains that the whole reason I ended up in Paris is because um she as a schoolgirl, went to a French convent school in Liverpool. So she thinks it's all absolutely down to her. And, you know, there's something to that. There's something to that. There's a Francophilia in the family yeah. and has been for a long time. And, um, and I think it was one of those things. It was like, you know, I, um, I was about 22 or 23 and I'd finished college and I was kind of knocking around Cork and I didn't really know what to do. And I had one of those wonderful moments, which... Um, I highly recommend to everyone to have a couple of times in their life. But um, it was that kind of moment where you say to yourself, if I could do anything in the world right now, what would I do? And I said, oh, God, I, I just wish I could move to Paris and write novels. And I just stopped and said, well, what's stopping you? You know, that's well within your reach. You can do that. Um, so I just did. And that was it. And it was just the most wonderful, liberating thing. Um, just to say, right, that's it. I'm off. I'm going to go and live in a garret in Paris. And it's exactly what I did. Um, right. So that's good. So what age are you at this point? 23. Wow. 23. That's, that's, that's quite dramatic, really. Isn't it? Yeah, it was. Dramatic. It was. Yeah. Um, and I think, I, I, you know, I'd had um, sort of a couple of years before, I'd had the year in, uh, in university in California, Um I'd also had a very sort of formative um, uh, short study course that I'd done in Paris. So I'd, I'd, I'd experienced Paris as a young adult. So yeah. I was dying to get back to that. Um, and I'd also, the other thing that was really, I mean, I was also tempted by, um, by the United States, maybe for further study, or um, I, had a, I had a standing offer to come and work in Hollywood at the time um, from a friend for whom I had worked uh, doing a little internship. And um, I also um, had been to the Edinburgh Festival several years in a row with theater productions and okay. Edinburgh I had, had absolutely enchanted me as well. Okay. Um, but I knew someone who lived there and she said, oh yeah, but you know, the winter. Um, because 
Edinburgh's all very well in kind of July and August, but um, you know when it's dark at three o'clock in the afternoon and howling yes. wind and freezing rain, not so much fun apparently. And that's coming from somebody who lived in Ireland, so I mean that's that's saying something. <laughs> yeah, I mean actually, as you go further north, it it that the the, the darkness descending is is a thing, isn't it? Oh yeah, for, yeah. It, I mean, it's it, lovely it, in the it, summer because yeah. it just doesn't get dark. But I mean, in the winter, it's pretty, pretty t- tough to deal with. I think. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, interesting. And so, so I decided. I decided Paris it is, and um, I think I, you know, sort of landed in Paris with, uh, I don't know, about two hundred quid in my pocket and um, a place to stay for the first month, and uh, and that was it. I, I just, you know, I just looked for a job um, and I ended up getting uh, getting a job in one of the old English language bookshops uh, on Avenue de l'Opéra. And um, yeah, it was just, all, it was all very, very romantic. I got a place, you know, lived in a little tiny studio, but it was close enough that I could walk to work across the bridges, uh, across the Seine, you know, it was, um, it was fantastic. And, and for many years, um, living in Paris was kind of what I did instead of being successful in any way, because people would ask my parents, what's Mark doing these days? And they'd say, oh, he lives in Paris. And they go, oh, gosh, you must be so proud. You know? <laughs> ah, that's brilliant. So, Isn't yeah, it? And it was fantastic. Like, so, you know, it was great. It was great. Um, and that was absolutely wonderful. Um, it was it was a really great way to spend the rest of my 20s mm. um and i've you know I, I, nearly i was i was there nearly 20 years and you know now i'm married and have a family and uh it's a bit different when when you've got little kids and we had the opportunity to move to the countryside so yeah. a couple of months ago we did that and um but i'm still i'm still going up to paris every week more or less during term time to teach in a university so um it's, it's kind of best of both worlds at the moment. That's good. That's good. So what other delights were, you know, what sort of did, did you discover in Paris about yourself and, and stuff? Because it, it's obviously one of these places. It's, it's, it's a bit like London, but I, I mean, London tends to suck people, suck people in and then burn them out, if you see what I mean. Um, yeah, absolutely. But, uh, you know, cities have a, have a sort of a thing about them, don't they? Uh, uh, so what was what was what was Paris like in that sort of way? You know, the sort of essence of the city. I think that um, you know I've always found London um, incredibly exciting. So much going on. There's just a kind of a pulse in the street. There's so much variety and eccentricity, and yeah. you know, bizarre mixtures of architecture. It's incredibly stimulating. And Paris isn't like that. Yeah. Paris is much more sedate and. I think if I could put it in one sort of short phrase, I would say that Paris is incredibly civilized, cultured, sophisticated, yes. and it makes you feel sophisticated. Like even if you're not, you know, um, even if you're not sophisticated, you can sort of walk across uh, the bridge by Notre Dame and uh, with a baguette under your arm. I mean, even, you know, in, in Cork, it was kind of, um, you know, drinking nagins of vodka in Dan Dooley's garage car park before going out at night. But in Paris, you can buy a cheap bottle of wine and you can go and sit by the Seine and drink it. And you're like, I am the king of the world. And this cost me three euros, you know? Um, yes. it, I think that there's a certain level of um, sophistication and culture and the good life the good life you know people people would tell me oh paris is so stressful and you'd say what are you talking about you know you go to you go to a park in paris and there's all these people sitting around reading books um in the sun and or or you know sitting at cafe terraces having animated discussions or just having a coffee or reading a book and you can go does nobody have a job like what are you all doing at three o'clock yeah that's interesting isn't it you know You've got this, um, the, the sort of the philosophical viewpoint of of that that of of Paris, you know, because I, I, I couldn't say that London was a philosophical place, if you see what I mean. Whereas you'd sort of go, well, Paris obviously is, you know, you've got Sartre and all, you yeah. know, it's that sort of yeah. But it is, but it's not just. That's what I like about Paris as well is that now, of course, it's an expensive world cap 
hospital. And of course, um, it's hard to live there if you're not extremely well off. But I never was and we managed. And um, there is also this thing of like quality of life is primary. People in France do not live to work. You know, job is not what defines them. Um, what defines them is more their savoir vivre, you know, it's their their quality of life. And and that is not just for rich people. It's like everybody, um, everybody is, is, you know, eating is important. Uh, cooking is important. Um, food, just that whole thing. Um, you know, I remember when I was a, when I was very young and first there and um, going for a drink with people after work. And in Ireland, you know, that could quite possibly have gone on all evening and ended in a kind of staggering home and getting a kebab or a fish and chips or something at one in the morning. But in Paris, at half past eight, everyone looked at their watches and was like, well, should we all go for dinner then? Because it was just time to eat, you know? You're not going to go and um, keep drinking um, yeah. all evening without, you know, there's, because these things are sacred, like meal times are sacred. Um, or if you walk down the street eating a sandwich in Paris, people will give you kind of amused looks and say bon appetit kind of sarcastically um, because, you know, you don't, you don't eat walking, you know, you have to sit down. Um, and sometimes they seem very, um, these seem to be kind of snobbish rules. And if you don't understand them, I think some people can feel a bit sort of um, that the French are a bit haughty haughty about these things. But actually, a lot of it is just about enjoying life, you know, taking the time to enjoy life. And, you know, in, in France, for example, you don't, um, you never start anything, anything um, from about mid July onwards, because once August comes, everybody's on holiday and then nothing gets done until the second week of September, you know, but it's like in, in, in most other sort of so-called civilized countries, the idea that everybody has mandatory five weeks holidays if not more um would seem insane and you know 35 hour work week um and there's also a um there's a a mandated um maximum price for books like books all have to be cheap um and you know there's so many things that um just strike me as incredibly civilized in the best yes. possible way. Healthcare is universal um, and healthcare is free. Um, social housing, um, just all of these things. And of course, France has a lot of problems like a lot of places, but um, I think successive governments have been trying to dismantle a very robust socialist safety net, yeah. um, well, socialist you know. society, you know? Um, yeah. And it, and it comes from not just an idea of equality. I think it comes from an idea of um, life isn't there just to be productive. Life is there to be enjoyed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we've, you know, the UK's got, got to a, a ridiculous pitch of that stuff that things that you look back and you thought, what happened to that? You know, what happened to you know, yeah. all this stuff that people struggled for, you know, with trade union law and all the rest of it, just to make people's lives bearable. And, and now people just working the most ridiculous hours. Just, uh, you know, it's insane. And it doesn't help. Because it, it, it is, and it's, it's, it's also happening everywhere, including in France, um, that somehow they're, they're selling us this, uh, this complete sort of de destruction of the welfare state and so on. Well, it's um, interesting that it's happening. It's happening in France as well. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's just it's it's just more robust and it's more anchored in France. And um, French people um, have a very healthy sort of um, willingness to get out in the street and protest and demonstrate. Um, you know, if if the government tries to pull pull a fast one on them. But increasingly what's happening is that they're just um, further militarizing the squashing of demonstrations. Mm. Um, and, you know, with the, with the Gilets Jaunes a couple of years ago, um, there was a lot of serious injury and death 
from the, the police, you, the militarized police using sort of so-called non-lethal methods like flashballs and um, tasers and all this kind of stuff. Um, but you know, they were they were maiming and killing in the streets. Interesting. Interesting. So <clears throat> let's sort of wander into this. Um, these because you've got quite a lot of things on the go, haven't you? One way or another, apart from just doing your writing. Yeah, that's yeah, I do. Um, lots of things on the go, but it's been a bit of a holding pattern recently. Yes, not, not all of them are really going very much, but I think, yeah, but know, I think that's again, quite <laughs> I could say from again, my own experience. This is, again, I'm not the only one who's found the last two years to be a little bit difficult to get on with things. Mm. Um, for me personally, things, things are starting to uh, free up and flow a bit better. Um, and I hope that, you know, in general, this is going to be the case for us. But, you know, um, I try not to look at the news as much as I used to. Very wise. I feel like I need to <laughs> protect, protect myself from it. Yes. But, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I, I, have a, I have a lot of projects. Um, and um, it's one of those things where I'm kind of juggling between what to do uh, what to do next, what to do first. Um, and I'm, I'm really, I'm one of those people who it's both a blessing and a curse, but I have great enthusiasm. Like I get really enthusiastic about stuff, a bit carried away, um, you know, having these great ideas, building castles in the air. And um, I think one of the lessons is that also I need to sort of pay a lot of attention to the foundations and sort of shore them up and base them on something. Um, I, I'm always the kind of teacher who will, you know, um, who's willing to teach anything at the drop of a hat, um, even something I know next to nothing about. I will go in and pretend, and I'm very convincing, which is again the Irish bullshit. Right? Yeah, yes, the, but there's an interesting point here. I'm going to because this is something that's never been said on this podcast. Go on. The best way to learn something is to teach it. I'll just put that out there. That is, that is absolutely true. And in fact, it is something that I often say. It is one of those things. If I want to learn something, um, the best way for me to learn it is to set myself the target of teaching it. And then, um, you know, a combination of sort of the dread of the deadline and also having to assimilate a subject in such a way that you can communicate it. Um, and what's interesting as well is that um, what I've found is that sometimes, um, now this might be a bit of a heresy to say, but... Um, no, no, I like, I like heresy. Far away. It's, sometimes it's better not to know too much about a subject. Like if you've got an encyclopedic knowledge, it will actually, like wading through that, parsing through that in order to communicate it to someone. But if you have sort of very rapidly and efficiently, like you have to have the kind of person who can do this, but um, who can skim really quickly a bunch of stuff and then put it in such a way that it sounds coherent and it sounds sort of um, communicable. You know, you make, make a story out of it, make a, make a thing you can pass on. If you know how to glean the main bullet points really quickly, then often you can communicate them to someone else. So the next episode of that will be out in a couple of days. Um, yeah, I hope, hope you managed to hear that all right, because Mark's level was a bit low, but um, I think it came across okay. Good. So until then, see you then. Mm-hmm.